So thanks for joining us. This is uh, part two and three. I'm going to put them together on this video. Uh, if you are doing the 101 class, you should have already done part one. If not, if you're in the wrong video, go back and do part one first. And that talks about what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be baptized, what it, the Lord's Supper means, all the really important parts of faith. In this section, what we're going to talk about is part two and part three. We're first going to talk about our beliefs and partnerships, and then we're going to talk about our strategy. Why do we do what we do? And I want to pray for you before we go. Father, I pray as folks are watching this that they would know whether or not to become part of our church. And if they do, that you, through your spirit, would help them to, uh, Lord, be qualified, to be uh, taken, to, to become such a part of our family that when others come, they would feel welcomed home. And Father, I pray for those right now, whatever's going on in their lives, that you would bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, join us as we do Beliefs in Partnership, and this part flies. You can watch it again if you need to, but here we go. All right, our Beliefs in Partnership, Surfside's purpose is this. We're helping people to find their way home to Christ so they can grow in love with him and invite other people home to Christ. Now, here is our statement of faith. In essential beliefs, we have unity. And that is in Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. It's the idea that in essential beliefs, in things where it talks about one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of us all, all the things about Jesus, who he is, what it means to be a Christian, we have unity on those things. In non-essential beliefs, we have liberty. We understand that we have some people in our church, for example, who have freedom. And so in Romans 14, it says, except whose faith is weak without passing judgment, on disputable matters. Now, they were talking about meat sacrifice to idols, but that works with anything, whether it's alcohol with dinner or uh, even dancing. You know, some people don't like to dance. So um, the truth is when you're dealing with somebody, for example, if you have someone who doesn't uh, want to drink or they struggle with alcohol, in non-essential beliefs, we have liberty. You have freedom to do anything inside of scripture, anything that it's okay. For example, if you want to have wine with dinner, However, we also want to keep this in mind. In all our beliefs, we show charity. So if you invite somebody over who cannot have wine with dinner for whatever reason, or as a church, we don't have alcohol on our property. Why? Because we want to have charity. We want to be careful with those. In our country, we have a huge problem, and you know this because we all have friends, with alcoholism. So what do we say? If I hold in my mind all human knowledge, but also the secret of God, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but I have not love, I amount to nothing at all. So we want to be loving no matter what we believe, no matter what we do with other people. And there will be times that even as a church, we won't agree with other churches, but in things that have to do with the Bible, we always go back to scripture and we stand strong on what scripture stands strong on and nothing else. Now, in your next notes, if you have uh, some questions about different um, theological statements or questions about the church or questions about what I believe as a pastor. You don't have to believe exactly what I believe, but I gave some statements, several pages. Uh, uh, some of them are pretty heady about things that I believe about different parts and what the Bible says about them. It might help you to study, look at that, feel free to do that. All right. Now, Surfside partners with other churches. Why do we do that? Because it makes us more effective in our community. It gives us some accountability and it helps us to help other people. Right now, we are sponsoring, I think, as this moment, we are helping to fund three other churches plus missions in our community and around the world, along with other organizations who are like-minded. Surfside fellowships with many other churches in our community through the Brevard Baptist Association. Nationally, Surfside is also affiliated with the Southern Baptist Convention. Over 10% of our offerings go to local and foreign missions. We also send International Mission Board and the North American Mission Board to send missionaries here on this continent and around the world, the largest mission organization in the world. Now, here's some common questions. Are you a part of the denomination? Yes, we call ourselves a purpose-driven Southern Baptist church. We're not like everyone else. So why didn't I know we were Southern Baptist? Well, it's a very diverse group of churches, and we don't look like a lot of other churches. They don't always look like us. But like all Southern Baptists, our belief in Scripture rises above our affiliation with one another. So if you came to our church, uh, you would see kind of a mix between traditional and, and uh, uh, also modern. And then other Baptist churches, very modern. Uh, in some churches <laughs> overseas, you'll see very modern. Other places, very traditional. Organ music, uh, suit and tie, the whole deal. But we have this in common. So my friends who are pastors at churches that wear suit and ties, we still believe the Bible 
the same way. But there are many advantages to being Southern Baptist, especially in worldwide missions and support. One of the things I remember is when there's a crisis, for example, when there was a hurricane in Haiti, there were other churches that started taking up funds uh, to collect food for Haiti. The Southern Baptists already had choppers, airplanes, full supplies and foods on the way. Why? Because we partner with them year after year. There are three semis right now in the United States that whenever there's a catastrophe, those semis, one's a feeding truck, the other one is a uh, washer and dryer truck, and the other one's a shower truck, semis that go to those areas to help. There's also churches from all over the country that each have uh, uh, what they call strike teams. I don't know if they call strike teams, but, but they're teams of people who go that bring chainsaws and food and other things to help. And we're the ones that the Red Cross calls. You can see us with the yellow hats. If you see people with the yellow hats in the background at any crisis, that's the Southern Baptist coming in and bringing in the Calvary. And if you want to be a part of that, you can talk to me and I can line you up with some people to help you be one of those first responders uh, with the Red Cross uh, to do that. Why not just be an independent church? Well, we are independent. Every Southern Baptist church is completely independent. There's no denominational control or hierarchy as there are most denominations. It doesn't mean that we don't help each other. It doesn't mean we don't encourage each other. It doesn't mean that there aren't times that the Southern Baptists step in and say, hey, this doctrine's way out of line. But each church is self-governed and determines its own affair. Now, people ask me this question. Well, don't non-denominational churches have more freedom? Well, some churches, even that claim to be non-denominational, are governed by other churches. There's actually a specific church, and it's all over the country. It has a very specific name. It also has more of a hierarchy than we do. You have to believe very specific biblical things, or you can't be a pastor in that church. And yet, they call themselves non-denominational. They're more of a denomination than the Southern Baptist. The Southern Baptist is more of an alignment. And so... Um, Denominations have the advantage of working together and sharing resources, and we're able to share in the community and around the world. So what do Baptists believe? This spells Baptist. I know it's kind of weird, but it means Bible is our sole authority, the autonomy of each local church, the priesthood of every believer, tithing, and I'll talk about tithing. By the way, just so you know, I have no idea what anyone in our church gives. And uh, that will always be true. And unless somebody comes and tells me, I don't know. So never think I know what you give. That's between you and God, not you and me. Immersion, which is baptism, which we talked about in the last thing. Spirit-led living. Listen, you want to be filled with the Spirit and walk in His Spirit through prayer, Bible study. And then finally, telling others about Christ. We all believe in telling others about Christ. We call that evangelism. So uh, once again, I put that little check there for Pastor Eric to answer some doctrinal questions. Now, Part three, you're already at part three, you've made it. All right, so here we go. It says, let there be real harmony among you. Oh, by the way, I wanna talk about giving for a minute. This is not uh, in my uh, book, but I wanna talk about it. In your notes, there is a sheet on giving for the right reasons. And here's a few thoughts. Giving is between you and God, not between you and anyone else. No one should ever give due to emotion or manipulation. Paul encouraged budget, budgeted giving, giving generously and giving joyfully. Listen, if you're a part of church, you should plan your giving. Now, we believe in tithing, and Dave Ramsey, and in this, this sheet, there's some, there's some great advice about that, but here's the deal. You plan your giving. Even if you start at a dollar or whatever you give, plan your giving. Make that part of your life, because if you're going to be part of a family, you want to be part of the responsibility of the church. God blesses us when we give. It's one of the things in the Bible where it says God blesses you. And it's amazing to me that so many people don't realize the blessing that happens when we give. We've all been on the receiving end of somebody doing something for us, but to be a part of that. And by the way, our church helps all kind of people. We don't always talk about it, make a big deal about it, but we help people. And if you're a part of our church, if you're a member of our church and you're struggling financially, you come to our church. The first time we help you uh, with bills, and other things. The second time I'll talk to you and uh, the folks who come to me about those things, I say, hey, let's look at your budget. Let's see what we can do. I'll line you up with somebody who can maybe help you with your budget, and then we'll work on helping you. But we never want anyone to go hungry inside or outside of our church. And then finally, it's between you and God. The pastors don't know what anyone gives. We have very few people who deal with our finances. We have several people that keep track of that but they're not judging you. They're not looking at you. A lot of times they don't even know who the check or whatever, however you give, whether it's online, the check, other ways. But I encourage you to give. 
the early church practiced setting aside a portion of what they give, and they practiced tithing. Tithing is 10% of what we make. Now, it seems like a lot, but there's a great Dave Ramsey article in your notes. You can read about it. Jesus even confirmed the tithes, but he condemned legalism. All right, and there's some Dave Ramsey stuff, and then the, uh, the questions that you can answer. All right, so now we're going to part three. I got there a little too early. Here's part three. Let there be real harmony among you so there won't be any split in the church. I plead with you to be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Listen, too many churches, people go and they say, what's the purpose of your church? Why do you do what you do? It's a country club. We never want to be a country club. We always want to be a family who's expecting guests. Remember, our main purpose statement of our church involves the idea of home. What do we want to do? When you have somebody at your home, what do you do? You want to welcome them. You want to make them feel loved. You want to make them feel cared about. So here's where we talk about our purpose, why we exist as a church. The purpose of our church is summarized in a single sentence based from two, two key scriptures, helping people to find their way, here's that word, home to Christ, so they can grow in love with him and invite others home to Christ. How, what is that based on? The great commandment. And here's some blanks in your notes if you don't have them. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. That is the great commandment. And then the second one's called the great commission. Almost any church you go to will say they do these things, even if they don't. The great commission says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. So what we want to do, we want to make disciples. You know, one of the awesome parts of our church is that we've been able to have people come in and be part-time pastors or come in and be on our staff. And we have helped to train and encourage them to go out. And right now there are three pastors in central Florida that came out of our church. And we're so excited about being part of sending others out. But we also have people in our church who started out just going to church or were away from God. And now they lead small groups or ministries or other things. That's what it means to be a disciple. Where does this idea come from? It comes from John 4, 1 through 42, which is a study of the woman at the well. The woman at the well made a discussion with Jesus. She was far from God. And what did Jesus do? Jesus made her feel welcome. And by the end of the conversation, he said, go and sin no more. He worked his way up to discipleship. Our commitment to, as a church, is to provide environments to move individuals from foyer to the backyard. And here's the deal. When people first come to church, a lot of times people are church shopping. They're very selfish and self-centered. And we want to move from being selfless and selfish and self-centered to selfless. So that 10 years from now, when I don't like the music anymore because the new kids are coming in with different music, I'm not so concerned about the music as I am about the lyrics and about what it says and how we do church. Now, let me see if I did four environments. Okay, let me talk about the four environments. And I, I, I don't have a good way to do this on this format, but you're just going to have to hang with me here. Imagine a salesperson come into your house. What happens? They come to the front door and you just step outside your front door. You don't want to let them in, but you're going to tell them who you are. Recently, we had some neighbors come to our house here and they came with a cake. We didn't know them well enough to invite them in, but we stood on the front porch. We talked to them for a few minutes. Now, this was before COVID, so it's been a little well, a year now, but um. What do we do? We got to know them just a little bit outside our home. Listen, a lot of times if you go and visit your neighbors, what are you going to do? You're going to knock on the door. You're not going to invite yourself in. You're just going to say, hi, we're here. We want to meet you. Here's some cookies. And we love to do that. How do we do that as a church? We invite guests. We invite neighbors, coworkers, our outreach events, our mailers. Even our website has some foyer environment, some information that somebody who doesn't know anything about us could learn. I love when we do our fall festival. Why? because we're providing an environment for a guest to get to know us. Number two is the living room. The living room is like our Saturday service, our Sunday service. It's a place where we challenge and relate to people. We want to help connect people to Christ through ministries. So here's an example. If you invited somebody over to your house, what would you do in your living room? Well, you'd have coffee ready. You'd make room for them to park. If you didn't have a lot of parking maybe at your house, you'd move away. You, maybe you would get out of the driveway so they could park in the driveway. Maybe you'd park down the street. Those are all things we try to do. What do you do? You open the door. You welcome them. At our church, when it's non-COVID, we have donuts and coffee. Why? Because it makes people feel welcome. We also don't just talk to our family. We don't sit and talk to our family. What do we do? We break free from them to talk to our new guests, to go out of our way to invite them. 
the other thing we don't do is uh, years ago, and I don't know if you've ever been to somebody's house that had children that were freaking out, but years ago, before we would have guests, I would say to my kids, now, Ricky, we're getting ready to have guests. I expect you to behave. Why don't you stay in your room and play with your toys? Or you can come out and say hi and then go back to your room. Now, if we were there and I was talking to our guests and all of a sudden my kids came through screaming and yelling, I would be sensitive to my guests and I would say, excuse me for just a minute. And then I would look at my kids and say, listen, uh, guys, we're going to have a discussion in a few minutes if you don't straighten up. So even when we have a family discussion as a church, for example, if we ever have to vote on budget, we, we typically don't talk much about budget on Sunday mornings or Saturday night. Why? Because we know we have guests. I would not, when I have guests over, I would not bring out my checkbook and ask them why we're spending so much on pizza. They're guests to our church. Be sensitive to our guests. That includes everything. Be careful of the conversations we have by the front door. Be careful of the things we say to our guests. And we want to be sensitive. We want to show them where the bathrooms are, right? We want to show them where the children's ministry are. We want to provide ministries for their children. And we want to go out of our way, what? To be the best hosts we can be. Why? Because God called us to love people. Number three, kitchen. This is our accountability. This is our small groups, our team, so we can know where people are. Everybody wants to feel loved and wanted. Listen, one of the hardest things right now with COVID is because people are separated, but we're still able to connect some with our teams. As our teams are able to get back together, for example, if somebody's scheduled on the door to greet and they don't show up, the head of our greeter team will call them and say, hey, are you okay? A lot of times it's not a big deal, but sometimes it may be somebody sick. You know what they'll do next? They'll call me and say, Pastor, I just want you to know, pray for Bobby Sue. I don't know why she's Bobby Sue. Pray for Bobby Sue. She's sick. And so I know to pray for Bobby Sue. And I might even later that week, if I know about it, reach out to Bobby Sue. We want relationships. And that's where discipleship and growth really occur is when you get to know each other. Most churches don't have a place where people get in small groups. That's the place where we really feel like home and we get to know each other. And then finally, it's the backyards where we reach people in our community around the world. Backyard, for example, remember we provide a foyer event, that, that, that uh, fall festival or winter festival that we have? Well, what do we do? We are at that time doing the backyard. We're reaching out. We also do mission trips. Eventually, we'll have an overseas mission trip, but we have some in-country mission trips that we are going to be cranking back up in the next year to go and serve just like you went out of the country. But here, uh, one of the guys who had always done overseas mission trips said to me, the difference between an overseas mission trip and a, uh, a in-country mission trip is only the sleeping. Everything else is the same. You're serving the same way. You're sweating the same way. You're working the same way. You just sleep a little better at night and you have internet access. So uh, that was his comment. I thought that was great. So we want to do what? We want to create these four environments. We get people to come to the foyer. We're just introducing ourselves to them. It's a, it's a way of you saying to somebody, hey, why don't you come visit our church? That's your foyer environment going out of your way. Living room. Hey, get in a small group, get in a place where you serve, get to know some people at church, connect with them. Even if it's two or three people for you to have a Bible study, that's that, that, that living, excuse me, that's actually the kitchen. Living room is like the weekend services. So what do we do? We invite people from the foyer. They come to the living room. We're sensitive to our guests. And then the kitchen, I got ahead of myself. Then the kitchen is when we invite people, we get in a small group, we get with two or three people, we grow in those areas. And then finally backyard. You know, you think the pastor could learn the four environments. Let's look at our structure. Oh, by the way, here's a little thing that I put in here about welcome to Selfish Restaurant. You know, it's funny, if we thought of our church more like we owned a restaurant, many of us would be much less selfish. I've been in churches where people uh, had guests come and sit in their chair and they came and said, I'm sorry, you're in my chair. Other times I've seen churches where the members take all the best parking and the guest has to park way away from the building. In other times, they mark a, a spot for the guest and people run at the guest and the guest is terrified. Listen, we want to make an environment where people feel welcome, love. We go out of our way to sacrifice ourselves. You know, just like if you were at your house and there were two donuts left on your plate, uh, when they got there, you would ask your guests, do you want this donut? We go out of our way from selfishness to being selfless. So there's a few things there about the selfish thing. So here's some better questions for us. What has God called me to do at Surfside? If you're going to join our church, what has God called you to do? Is it hold a door? We feel like everyone has a task and every task is important. And so is it hold a door? Is it work with children? Is it rock a baby? Is it sit in the children's ministry just to help to watch and to be another set of eyes? Is it to check children in? Is it to work with the sound, the production team? Is it 
to uh, work in the kitchen ministry that's getting cranked back up? Is it to even come during the week and say, hey, can I do some extra cleaning of the building? It can be anything, but what has God called you to do? What gifts have I have, do I have? And then how can I teach somebody else? Listen, the idea of being a greeter is not for you to just be a greeter, but it's also so you can teach other people. Is there a need that I'm called to fill on a stunt basis? You know, there may be something that's not your big gift, but maybe you've noticed a need. Jesus washed his disciples' feet, not because he was a great foot washer, although I'm sure he was great. The truth is he washed his disciples' feet because they needed to be washed. Sometimes we just need to look around and say, what needs to be done? And then say, okay, God, I'm going to do that until somebody else does it. Did you know I sometimes do things for weeks and even months at a time because I haven't got anybody else to do it. So what do I do? I pick up the signs. I carry them out to the road. I maybe change the sign in the building. Why? Because we had somebody who used to do that that left. There was nobody else trained to do it. So guess what? I'll do it until somebody else can. That means sometimes I come in sweaty. <laughs> it means sometimes that I come in and I've been running outside. I'm a little bit late getting back in, but guess what? We go out of our way to do stunt ministry to help other people. Am I making disciples in a small group? What can I do to help the others find their way home to Christ? Am I praying? Listen, if you're prayed up and spending time in Bible study before you come to church, it is going to be a lot easier to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and to other people in our church if you're paying attention. And then finally, do I recognize the grace of God for me and others? Listen, everybody's messed up. The sooner you realize that, the better you'll treat everybody else. Here's success in ministry. Success in ministry is not just completing a task, but training someone else to do it better. In most churches, you'll find the same people doing the same task 10 or 20 years later. So Bobby Sue, who's been on the door, I don't know why she's still on the door, but she's been on the door for 10 years during first service. She's never going to let anybody else be on that door. Guess what? Bobby Sue should start training other people. The sound team should start training other people. There should be people stepping up going, how can I learn how to do that? So that one day we don't just drop people in there. We don't want it to be my ministry, my door, my table. Serving is about building relationships and about discipleship. Don't be selfish. Allowing others to serve also helps others grow. Now, here's some unselfish statements. We believe in crockpot, not microwave Christianity. We understand that people grow slow. We need to give them time. God wants us to have mirrors more than microscopes. That means, listen, look at your own heart before you judge other people, especially coming into church. Listen, love people where they're at, no matter what they look like, no matter what they smell like. Uh, I've hugged people and I've hugged anti-deodorant people for years. And guess what? It doesn't matter. They're more important than their lack of deodorant. But I would say for each of us, wear deodorant, have a breath mint, be loving to the other people. <laughs> All right. If we park away, they will stay. This is one of the small keys to our church that's a big deal. I've had so many people say to me, I was late to church. I had my family. We didn't want to come. But when we got there, we got a front row seat. We know that God did that for us. And I'm thinking, yes, God did that. And a bunch of people who were unselfish. Uh, I also want us to encourage you, give up your seat for your guests. If you notice that certain parts of the church are getting filled up and people like those seats, hey, give them those seats. You sit wherever you can to make room for guests, just like you would at your house. Always welcome guests to our home. Sometimes you're going to have to break away from your friends. Listen, one of the worst things that happens is sometimes at the door when people are coming in, we get busy talking to each other and we don't welcome other people. Break away from your friends. After church, instead of going straight to your friends, take that first 30 seconds to, to look for somebody you haven't talked to and just say, hey, don't say, don't say I've never seen you. Don't say I don't know who you are. Just say, I haven't got a chance to meet you. My name is, and say your name, don't say my name. Okay, where does God want me to serve? Who am I teaching? And then who am I praying for? When's the last time you prayed that God would put somebody on your heart to invite to church or to even ask them, hey, have you ever become a Christian? Our big statements are love God and love others. Now, here's, some, here's just some positions in our church. Me, this is in your notes and you can read it. Pastor Eric oversees all pastor staff, health of the church. David Alexander oversees the worship and music. Jill Spolstra, our awesome children's director. And Michelle and Holly right now are leading up our youth. Diane Green is my pastor's administrative assistant, information, publication, and I put grantor of wishes. <laughs> Mike Williams, who's been with me forever and a day, who did not go to church before I was able to get him to, he was able to come to church. I was able to baptize he and his family in the last 20 years, and we have worked together for many years. A wonderful man. If you haven't got to meet him, I encourage you to meet Mike. He also helps to direct our senior adult ministry. And there's more ministers on the way. We are in, in the uh, middle of training some new folks to visit the hospitals, to be a part of ministry. We have other folks who get up and share during the week. You've probably seen Rodney and Steve who get up and share. 
but we're adding more and more people to do ministry at our church. Now, we have an advisory team. Uh, the advisory team at some churches, they have a deacon board. We don't have a deacon board. We have an advisory team. They give advice. They help set the direction. You can see that in our constitution. We have a budget team. When we change the budget, we put a budget team together. Sometimes we leave the budget the same. And so we don't necessarily have to have a budget team, but we still vote on the budget with the church members every year. And then we have team leaders in various ministries. And finally, small group ministries, my favorite, um, the folks who help lead Bible studies and really get to know people. All of these groups should be accountable to the church. So if you lead a small group and you want us to advertise for you, you just need to be accountable with what you're doing. Uh, you know, you can't be worshiping Satan and start a small group. That's one of my rules. I know it's a tough one. So, all right. Now, why should we should never stop growing? Number one, because God loves people. And there's several verses that say that, but the Lord is patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but wants everyone to come to repent it. God loves outsiders. Did you know that? Go into the country, urge anyone you come to find in. So when somebody comes to church, one of my favorite things, when somebody says, I haven't been to church in years because God wants us to grow. Under Christ's control, the whole body's nourished and grows. We believe our church must grow larger as we bring people in through our foyer into our living room. And then what do we do? We get them in the kitchen, those small groups so then we can serve others. And remember, if God builds it, they will come. Now, here's Surfside's vision statement, and I want to encourage you to just look at this, how we seek to minister to others, and then here's some things that we say. We want to, we, we're helping people to find their way home to Christ so they can grow in love with him and invite others home to Christ. Now, in your book, you will also find, uh, let me, oh, let me answer this question first. Why do we sign a commitment form? We ask our members to sign a commitment. So if you want to finish this class and join the church, you need to sign a commitment form at the end of this class. Read it. Make sure you agree with it. It is not a legal contract, but it's simply a way to encourage our members and remind them of biblical commitments of all believers. Just like a roster, it's to let us know who's on the team. Now, in your book, I don't have a slide on this, but in your book, you'll find something called making things right with others. Listen, if you're going to be around people in small groups, there's going to be times that you rub shoulders. Sometimes you don't get along. And even at work, sometimes we may have somebody we fight with. This is a sheet about how to make things right with others. I got part of this from my mentor, Dave Daniel, part from my mentor, uh, Peter Lord, and a few other people. And we put this together to make it easy for you. If you're a Christian dealing with a non-Christian, or if you're a Christian dealing with other Christians, what you should do to check your heart before you go and confront somebody about sin. And it's very specific about that. So look at that in your book. That's important. Now, we want to help people find their way home to Christ so they can grow in love with him. There, this is the beginning of our membership commitment. So take some time, read through this commitment. These are just things, who we are as a church, why we do what we do. We understand that you're not going to be perfect. This is not a checklist for you to say, I got to do these things or I can't be a part of the church. But it's a commitment to say, you know what, Eric, I want God to help me grow in these areas. And when you sign that, if you've been baptized as a believer and you turn that in, guess what? You agree with this form, you turn it in, and you can become part of our church. You need to get this to either our secretary, get it to me, you can email it, you can text it, you can bring it live. I don't think you can text it. Well, I guess you could text it. Uh, smoke signals won't work for this, but bring it in and let us know. We also have other classes, and in the future, we'll be doing a 201 this way, and eventually, we're going to go back to having our 301 class. I hope you've enjoyed this class. I love you guys. If you have any questions, please send us a note. Let me pray to close. Father, I pray for each one as they decide whether to join our church or not, that Father, right now, you would fill them with your spirit, that no matter what they do, Lord, whether it's sign this commitment, whether it's agree to take that next step of baptism, whether it's a step of faith to, to be somewhere else, Lord, that they would know that you've called them to be a part of a family. Thank you for this time in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for joining our classes. I love you guys. God bless you and keep you. Any questions, send me an email, send me a note, pastor at the Surfside Fellowship. Dot com. All right, we love you. Bye. I got to stop this video. <laughs>